When I think of the cross, I think of the insults and the mockery that came from the crowd. I think of a painful 39 lashes and the excruciating pain from a thorn-filled crown. When I think of the cross, I, I think of brutal suffering and the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus willingly stepped into. You see, the greatest act of love is for the innocent to stand in place for the guilty. And 
That's exactly what Jesus did when he stood in place for you and me. It's what we call grace. And in a moment of grace, far beyond anything that we could ever comprehend, Jesus took on all our anger, all our anxiety, all our brokenness, all our pain, all our past, every single mistake, all our shame. He took on all the things that we try to carry, but they're just so heavy. But Jesus didn't come just to simply take those things. He came to give us freedom. Because of Him, you're no longer lost to your past. Because of Him, you're no longer a slave to your shame. Because of Him, you're no longer a prisoner to your pain. Because of Him, you're no longer bound to your sin. Because of Jesus, we can actually take these things and lay them down at the foot of the cross. See, God's love has liberated us, you and me. Free to forever walk in the light of His amazing grace. Well, good morning, church. Happy Easter Sunday. Why don't you stand so we can worship together?
moving, he is moving, he's alive. Take this freedom, take this love. Can you feel it rising up? He is here, he is here, he's alive. He lives. Honor and power are his. All glory forever. Amen. Jesus, he lives. All honor and power are his. All glory forever. Amen. Jesus lives. Jesus lives. He lives. He's moving here. Well, you took all of our shame and left it in. Amen. He lives. Amen. I want to welcome those that are joining live stream and you that are here today. You know, when the early church gathered, they would, they would greet each other on Easter morning and would say, he is risen. And they would respond, he is risen indeed. Amen. So we serve a risen Savior. And because of that, we can expect what happened in the Gospels to happen today because he's still living. You know, I was just reading our little devotion. I don't know how many of you have joined in, but I was reading it today, and it brought us to the story of Jesus when he says to his disciples on one occasion, one day it said, let's go over to the other side of the lake. They had no idea what was about to happen. Who initiated it? Jesus did. He's so tired, he falls asleep. A storm comes along, they think they're gonna drown. So they're just filled with fear. They wake Jesus up, and he says to them, where is your faith? Isn't that an interesting question? Jesus now turns and speaks to the raging waters and wind and says, be still. Immediately, the storm stops, and the first thing out of their mouth is, who is this? Isn't that interesting? Well, how many know most of us can't talk to the weather like that? So, I mean, that's going to raise a question right there. And then the next story is they get to the other side, and there's a demon-possessed man, and he knows who Jesus is because he says, don't torment me, you holy one of God. So Jesus is revealing to his disciples that he is more than just a man. He is God in the flesh. 
And I think we need to know something today that the same Jesus that spoke to the storm, the same Jesus that delivered the man who was tormented is the same Jesus that is here to answer our prayer today. And I'm gonna have the altar workers come at this time. If you have a need in your life or you're concerned about someone, come and we will pray. And let's allow Jesus to do a miracle. Because we've been praying this morning that God would do miracles today. And I believe he will. Come.
amazing God, church. He is risen, he's conquered death. Let's worship him. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in sacrifice that you made on our behalf so that we could stand in your presence, that we could worship you with no barrier, that we could come directly to you and you would hear our cry, that you would comfort us, that you are with us always. God, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Church, well, it's so good to worship with you this morning. Why don't you turn and greet those around you and welcome them here as well.
Happy Easter. Hello and welcome to Living Stones Church. And whether you're with us in person or joining us online, we're just so glad that you're here to spend part of your Easter weekend with us. We wanna invite you at this time to fill out a Connect card and you could send your prayer requests or simply tell us if you need any information about LSC. For those of you that are joining us online, you can fill that same form out at livingstones.ab.ca slash connect. And if you wanna give today, you can also do so at the Information Center right after the service. And if you'd like more information on all of our giving options, including e-transfers, click the Give button on our website. Get ready for the most exciting event of the summer, Living Water VBS 2024. Now VBS or Vacation Bible School is a kids day camp at our church that hosts 200 kids for five fun-filled days. VBS is from August the 12th through 16th from 9 a.m. to noon every day. This year, we are diving in to explore the beauty of God's underwater creation, and we will learn about water that's so refreshing that Jesus said we would never thirst again. Pre-registration for our church family opens today with a special QR code. And if you like more information, you can look for our VBS booth in the foyer. After reflecting on Jesus' death on Good Friday and celebrating his resurrection today, we'll be gathering for three nights of prayer and fasting happening on April the 8th, 9th, and the 10th. Spring is a time of hope and renewal. And so let's come together as a church family for a special time of worship and prayer. If you'd like more information, you can check out our website. Ladies, mark your calendars for our spring event coming up on April the 22nd with our guest speaker, Linda Davies. Join us in the Fellowship Hall at 7 p.m. for the beauty of simplicity. Invite a friend and learn how to find freedom in the simplicity of life in your home and your workspace. Registration is only $15 per person and you can do so online by April the 15th. Don't forget to check out the cafe after each of our morning services, where you will find a delicious Easter buffet and lots of fellowship. This week's feature items are lemon sage turkey, maple Dijon glazed ham, and empty grave chocolate pudding dessert. Our full menu is posted on the bulletin board in the hallway on your way down to the fellowship hall. Hey, thank you so much for spending part of your weekend at Living Stones Church, and we're so thrilled to have you here. If you have any questions about anything you've heard today, or maybe you'd just like to learn more about LSC, just stop by the Information Center, or you can visit us online at livingstones.ab.ca. If you're new here, we want you to feel right at home, and so we want to invite you to stop by the guest reception kiosk after the service, and we have a gift for you, and we'd love to meet you. I will now dismiss middle school youth and pass it on to Pastor Paul. Happy Easter and have a great day at church. Amen. Well, why don't we stand? We'll help the middle schoolers slip out, but we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. So, Father, we thank you this morning for your amazing, amazing grace as revealed to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, you've given us a blessed hope. You've given us something worth living for. It transcends this life. We now know that death no longer is our ultimate enemy. It's been defeated by your resurrection. And so that you, who are the first fruits, encourages us to know that we too shall rise again. We shall be forever in your presence. And we thank you for that. Father, we pray today as we are gathered here that you would help us have our hearts open that we'd hear your voice speaking into our lives both individually and collectively. Father, you know the needs in each heart, Father. You know those that are struggling with loss, those that are walking through a season of grief, those that are walking through challenges. Maybe it's, uh, as, as your word speaks of, going through the fire, walking and not drowning in the waters, Lord, but that you are with us in those seasons. And we pray today that you would be with each one that's walking through that hour in a very precious and special way. Lord, I pray today as we hear your voice that we would respond to you, that we would not just hear words, Lord, 
but that they would be life-giving words. They would be a lifeline to our current situation, that we would respond to you today and embrace and actually act upon that which we hear. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. 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 You may be seated. On February 27, 1991, Ruth Dillo was at her home in Kansas when the phone rang. The Pentagon was actually calling and they explained to her that her son, Clayton Carpenter, had stepped on a landmine in the Persian Gulf and that he had passed away. He was dead. She said, it was an awful, sickening reality to learn that my son would never return home. But three days later, she received another phone call and the voice on the other end said, Mom, I'm alive. Now, how many know that would be a little bit of a shock? She said at first she couldn't believe it was the voice of her 23-year-old son over whom she had been mourning for nearly three days. She said, I jumped up and down. I was overjoyed. I was screaming, yelling, crying, dancing, just overwhelmed with the joy and the news that my son who I thought was dead was now alive. I can't even imagine. But really, that's kind of the context of the resurrection story. You know, can you imagine the the joy, the thrill of having gone from the very depths of despair, people who had invested their life in Jesus, believed in him, walked with him, expected that the kingdom of God would now rule and reign in Israel, and then they saw him beaten, crucified, and eventually laid in a tomb. They were disillusioned, they were brokenhearted, they were crushed. As a matter of fact, the early followers of Jesus had witnessed this betrayal, the hastily assembled verdict that was a sham to justice. And they had been watching as he was crucified. During the next two days, they grieved, struggling with shame for not standing with him in the last hours, also dealing with their own dreams and hopes that were totally crushed. But like Ruth Dillow, the moment came when they heard the incredibly, seemingly unbelievable news Women from their company came breathlessly into the upper room declaring Jesus is alive. I can't even imagine. For 40 days then, Jesus now continues to appear to them, making himself known to them, instructing them, teaching them, explaining to them that their expectation of God's kingdom at that point had been wrong and that going from scripture began to explain how he was fulfilling the scriptures and that something greater than just the conquest of a Roman empire was really at hand. As a matter of fact, Jesus came to deal with humanity's greatest problem. You say, what is that? Sin. And sin always brings death. And Jesus came to address the sin problem so he could address the death problem so that you and I would no longer have to fear death. The last enemy, the great enemy against humanity was now defeated. And because Jesus rose from the dead, you and I have a hope that we too shall rise and that we shall live forever and ever. What an amazing hope. And Jesus came to bring that. Jesus is actually, I mean, the resurrection is actually at the heart of the story, but let me, I, I'm just getting ahead of myself here. All right, yeah, Jesus is alive. The message of Easter, it's the message of the hope, of a hope that the world in despair needs to hear. It's the message that our society desperately needs. It's the message that the first disciples preached. It's the message that G, uh, Peter preached to a crowd of people in the very city that Jesus was crucified 50 days after his death. It was during the Feast of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon his his disciples to empower them to become witnesses. And after explaining the miracle of the outpouring of God's Spirit from the book of Joel, Peter then shifts to the essence of Christianity, which is the resurrection. And as G. Campbell Morgan said, at the heart of the mission of Jesus is the resurrection. It is the most significant event of the church You know, it's actually the foundation of the church. Because we're going to find out if there's no resurrection, we're wasting our time. This is it. This is the message, folks. That's why we celebrate that death now is defeated to those who have put their trust in Christ. Sin no longer has authority and dominion in our lives. If we're a true child of God, that's true. You know, 
Easter is actually our declaration of independence. It's our declaration of freedom. I am free. Jesus has made me free. Most of the persecution in the early church arose over the preaching on the resurrection. You know the Apostle Paul standing before the Roman governor Felix, and he says this, it's concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am now on trial before you today. Isn't that interesting? He said, this is the crux of the issue, the resurrection. I don't know if you realize that, but many Jews did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. Matter of fact, we know the Sadducees didn't believe in it. Some Pharisees believed that there was a resurrection, but I don't think they understood how it was gonna come about. You know, but Jesus actually provided the means by which you and I can actually live eternally. He provided the means. Paul preaching to those in Athens, dealing with people who were, philosoph were philosophical in their approach, struggled with the concept. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 17, verse 32, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Paul talks about how critical this idea is, and he devotes an entire chapter in 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, probably the greatest chapter on the resurrection. He says this, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. He goes on to say, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So what's he saying? The foundation of everything is the resurrection. He goes on to say here, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have been testified that God, that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him in, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. How many are catching on? This is the core, the crux, the heart, the issue of what Christianity is all about. He goes down, then those also who have fallen asleep, that's a euphemism, a nice way of saying those who are, have died, but the people who have fallen asleep is actually talking about believers in Christ are, are still lost if Christ is not, if there's no resurrection. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ, but... I like that word. It negates everything you just said. But Christ indeed has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So we're going to travel back in time to that first message that God inspired Peter to preach, the preaching of the resurrection at the birth of the New Testament church on the day of Pentecost. Without the resurrection, there would be no church. As a matter of fact, it is the only explanation for the church the resurrection. So Peter now, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, states four life-changing truths that when we embrace them, we're transformed from an ever-diminishing life, because that's what's happening when we're born into the world, we're born to die. And if we're born in sin, we're going to born to a diminishing life. And we see people's lives diminishing before our eyes. We see, you know, the spiritual dynamics, the emotional dynamics. We see the, the death uh, element happening in people's life, an ever diminishing life now transforms to eternal one. And I have to remind us that eternal life doesn't begin when we die physically. Eternal life begins when we receive Christ. Eternal life is not just a forever life. Eternal life is a quality of life. It's a life of joy. It's a life of hope. It's a life of peace. It's a life of forgiveness. It's a life of grace. This is the life that Jesus desires for us. But let's take a look at these four life-changing truths. The first one, planned by God. You know, this event is not just, oh, it just sort of happened. You know, a lot of times in life we look at things and we go, oh, it just kind of serendipitously happened. No, no, this was all orchestrated and planned by God. As a matter of fact, God planned this before the foundation of the world. Isn't that amazing? So when God made us in his image, he actually gave us you know, certain things like the, the beautiful part of how we function as a human being. And one of those parts is we make choices. We have a will. God gave it to us. But how many know when you give somebody a will, you also give them the choice to make wrong decisions? And how many know as human beings, we do make wrong decisions? 
And we know that from the story of Adam and Eve. And how many know it's pretty easy to say, well, you know, if it wasn't for Adam and Eve, we wouldn't be in all of this mess. But that's easy to blame them. But how many know that you and I wouldn't have done much better? Because if we look at our lives right now, we probably said, yeah, I have made some pretty poor decisions in my life, so I would have messed up as well. So I don't want to blame them. I think we need to look at ourselves and say, you know, I need to be forgiven. I need this wonderful plan of salvation. I need this gift from God that Jesus provides for us. Here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, Peter starts out, fellow Israelites. He's now explained the gift of the Holy Spirit, but now he starts to really get to the heart of the message. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was the man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. This is my, my calling card. This is my authentication that I am who I say I am. Miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. We'll come back to that powerful statement. This is not happening by accident. And you with the help of wicked men. Now, isn't that interesting? He doesn't let these guys off the hook. He said, you guys are responsible for this death. You put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So Peter begins by pointing out the unique nature of Jesus Christ. Miracles, signs, wonders. It was to establish in their minds that he is God's Messiah, the anointed one, promised. He came to save people from sin. Peter speaking to an audience well aware of the facts. Nobody disputes the miraculous nature of Christ's ministry. I like what John Meyer in the New York Times article years ago said, many treatments of Jesus gets bogged down in discussions of the possibility of miracles. Properly speaking, that's a philosophical rather than a historical or even a theological problem. All that need to be noted is that the ancient Christian, Jewish people, pagan sources all agree that Jesus did extraordinary things not easily explained by human means. The problem they were having, while Jesus' disciples pointed to the Spirit of God as the source of that power, Jewish and pagan adversaries spoke of demonic or magical forces that had never occurred to any to claim that those miracle signs and wonders ever happened. They didn't even argue that point. They believed it. What that tells us is that the early opponents of Christianity never doubted the fact that Jesus did incredible supernatural miracles and signs, even though people today often struggle with miracles happening now. Isn't that interesting? We have a totally different problem. They were more concerned about what was the source of it. We're even questioning the credibility, if it even exists. They did not. They saw it. They had dead people coming back to life. They saw blind uh, people that were blind begin to see. They saw people that were paralyzed begin to walk. They saw all of those things. They weren't disputing that that happened. But now Peter uh, is going to point to the greatest miracle of them all, the resurrection of Jesus and all of the implications that that brings to not only that hour, but to our hour as well. This is actually God's deliberate plan. Notice the expression, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. Even though they were personally responsible for committing this great injustice by handing over Jesus to the Romans to be crucified, Peter points out that God even incorporates man's sinful behavior to fulfill his ultimate purposes. Now what that really means is we don't go out to sin in order for God to do good. No, that's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is God even uses the greatest evils in the world to create an avenue for good to come, despite those things. And think about the greatest evil in the world. Here's the perfect human being, because Jesus was, who was expressing the greatest level of love and providing the most amazing message possible, and he was killed by those whom he came to save. Isn't that amazing? And yet God used that very element to bring about the greatest good. I think that's amazing. Only God can do that kind of stuff. We can't pull that off, but God certainly can. The Old Testament prophesied or foretold through scriptures the Messiah's birth, miracles, betrayal by a close associate, 
uh, the abandonment by the disciples, being given over to Gentiles, crucified, and ultimately his resurrection. None of these things happened by accident. They were all foretold in the Old Testament. Isn't that amazing? You know, I always think it's interesting. You can't really predict where you're going to be born. You know, nobody can do that. But yet God said he'll be born in Bethlehem, and he was. Over and over again, we read in the Old Testament, and it's pointed out by the apostles who wrote the New Testament, that God planned all of this. Jesus was a willing participant in the entire plan of salvation. This was not something that Jesus had no control over. It was an act that he, was will, he willingly chose, and he did it because he loves us. You know, I remember reading the story years ago about uh, a young French soldier in World War I, and he was deeply wounded, and the doctor was doing surgery, and his arm was really crushed, and he realized he couldn't save it, so he amputated it. He felt bad, and so the doctor, after waiting for the anesthesia to wear off, he said to this young man, I'm so sorry that you lost your arm. To which this young man said, I did not lose it. I gave it for France. In the same way, Jesus was not caught up in a mesh of circumstances that he could not break free from. Apart from any divine power, he could call on angels to deliver him at any moment, but he didn't do that. In the end, he didn't lose his life. He gave it. He chose to give it to you and to me. The second life-changing principle that was promised by God, what God says, he'll do. You know, you and I can have every good intention to follow through. We promise something. We try to follow through, but maybe circumstances or something comes along. We're unable to do it. What I love about God is when he makes a promise, he's always capable of fulfilling exactly what he promises. He can control the circumstances. You and I cannot do that. He can even take our willful refusal to do his will and still work out his purposes, which I think is amazing. I mean, you think about Pharaoh in Egypt. Remember him? Where our God used him as an instrument to fulfill his purposes in delivering the Israelites out of slavery. And you know, I know sometimes we read the Bible and it seems a little confusing because we read in one text in Exodus that it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And then another text we read and Pharaoh hardened his heart. And we're a little confused as to who hardened whose heart, right? But the reality is, I think both things are true. Because God knew Pharaoh was stubborn and he also understood, which many times we don't understand, that Pharaoh himself thought he was God. The pharaohs believed that they were gods. And so when Moses was demanding the release of the slaves, he said, well, who, who is demanding this? In Pharaoh's mind, he is God. And isn't it amazing? Moses says, well, you're going to find out who the real God is here in a minute. And so we have these amazing plagues. And every time a plague came along, God knew the nature of the man, and he hardened his heart. And who was creating the context of that? God was, because he was allowing the plagues to come, which, in a sense, God was hardening his heart. So both things are true at once. Peter now explains that Jesus' resurrection is promised in the Scripture, and he begins to quote Psalm 16. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. You know, Jesus actually speaks to this text. This text is used more than any other, I believe, Old Testament text in the New Testament. He says, I saw the Lord always before me. Jesus actually quotes this and says, who's David talking about? You know, well, of course Jesus knows. He's talking about himself here. He's talking about Jesus. David is actually, Jesus is actually a descendant of David. He said, because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your holy one see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with the joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. In other words, what he's saying is, David wasn't talking about himself because David died and his tomb is there. He was talking about one of his descendants who would die and his body would not experience decay. So Peter's now making an argument here. He goes on to say, 
But he was a prophet, David was, and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. In other words, this descendant who was on the throne of David would be one who would never see decay. And Jesus is actually the son of David. He's the one he's talking about. Next verse. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. David was not, you know, not only did David's body decay, but Jesus' body was missing. It was a known fact. He was not writing about himself. If there were any doubts, Peter and the disciples literally could point out David's tomb, number one, in Jerusalem, and number two, he could take the crowd over to the empty tomb and say, where's the body? And even though there were rumors spreading that the disciples had stolen the body, the question is, why would they do that? They were not in a position to even understand any of these things until Jesus appeared to them and began to explain what was going on. And here's a little picture right now of David's tomb. I just thought you might want to see it because I've been to Israel a few times. That's David's tomb. That's where David's body is. I could tell you right now, he's not talking about himself. He's talking about Jesus, all right? Uh, you, know, there's, you know, often we, we miss little details in Scripture. I, I want to share a very obscure text of Scripture that you may not have picked up on. Um, and it's really... Uh, um, well, here's, the, here's an empty tomb. This is a few years ago. That's my youngest daughter. She was little then. So that's, that's a tomb that's empty. Now, we could dispute. There's a lot of people say that's the empty tomb. I'm going, I don't know if it is or not, but that's not the point. It's the kind of tomb that Jesus was buried in and stone was rolled away. The tomb is empty, folks. Um, so let's pick up this obscure text. It's found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27. It says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. We're speaking about the crucifixion here. Verse 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That's an amazing statement because that temple curtain, you know, sometimes we get a picture. It was actually tall, huge, and very high. Nobody could have gone up and reached up and got it. But it was torn from what? The top to the bottom. It's, it's a symbol of God saying, I'm letting you into my presence. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, I made a way. I've made a new way into my presence. Okay, now what else happened? Uh, the earth shook and the rock split. So we have an earthquake. We have tremors. We also had an eclipse. The sky was darkened. Even scientists will tell what eclipse is. It just blackens everything out. There was an eclipse. But then we keep reading. A lot of manifestations are happening at Christ's death. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Okay, now something's interesting happening. And then here's the part you need to see. Verse 53, they came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, that's the key word, after Jesus' resurrection, so a couple of days go by, Jesus is raised from the dead. Now all of a sudden, the people, the tombs that were open are now broken out and they go into the holy city, which is Jerusalem, the same place where Jesus was crucified, and they start appearing to people. Now how many go, this is a little freaky, because now you've got dead relatives showing up at your house. Now not only was it weird, I'm, I'm just telling you what it was like, you're st- you know, Jesus is dying on the cross. You get an eclipse, an earthquake, and then a couple of days later, a whole bunch of dead people are walking around visiting people in Jerusalem. How many know? That probably gets a few people's attention. Don't you think people are talking? I mean, listen, everything about Jesus creates attention. I mean, the week before, Lazarus, who was dead for four days, is now alive, and you have all of these people in Jerusalem who have experienced miracles... And now you have this happening. Now why am I bringing all of this out? Because when Peter is preaching, he's got a lot of backup evidence, is what I'm trying to tell you. He's able to point out, oh, there's David's tomb. Oh, by the way, the tomb is empty. Oh, by the way, did you see the relative that showed up at your house the other day? You know, what in the world is going on here, guys? Okay, let's go to the third point. This life-changing truth 
was accomplished through the power of God. This is not human beings pulling this stuff. This isn't, you know, some sort of a trick, you know. It's obviously a miracle of incredible magnitude. To be brought back to life can only be accomplished by the power of God. And Paul, who's writing to the Romans, makes a powerful argument that the reason why uh, God, this is actually God's signature move. It's his sign and seal that Jesus is actually God. Listen to what Paul says in Romans. He said, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the good news of God, the gospel's good news. He says, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture, so this is not coming out of nowhere, it's coming from the text of Scripture, regarding his son, who as to his human nature was the descendant of David. We've already talked about that. But look at the next verse. And who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God. How? By his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. So the resurrection is authenticating that Jesus is actually God. And that he was raised from the dead by his father. By the spirit of God in this father. Okay. Now, Peter states that it's impossible for death to hold Jesus. The power of his sinless life could not keep him in the tomb. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then, I love this, this is Howard Marshall points this out, very interesting. He says, we have a remarkable mixed metaphor in which death is regarded as being in labor and unable to hold back its child, the Messiah. <laughs> Interesting, he had to deliver up the child. Goes on to say, and if we ask why death could not hold back Jesus, Peter's reply would be that Jesus was the Messiah, and that the Messiah could not be held by death. And that's one of the reasons why the enemy uh, of our souls uh, is... Well, let me go back and just, it, it battles us so, so fiercely because you and I, this is one of the more compelling arguments, is the demonstration of God's power in a changed life. So when you have transformation happening inside of people, it's, it's a very powerful thing. People begin to take note when they see change of this magnitude. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why the enemy of our soul battles so diligently against us. We need to understand something. He wants to defeat our lives because what he's trying to do is discredit the work of the gospel and its message through our lives. That's what he's working on. But when you and I walk in obedience to God, what we are doing is declaring the transforming power of God. Now, I know when we're a Christian, we, some of us probably grew up in a Christian home and we've learned about Jesus since we're a little child. And so it just seems like it's very incremental. We came to faith, we believed. Uh, we've been seeing you know, incremental changes in our lives, but it seems very incremental. But then there are some people, it's very dramatic. How many know that's true? Very dramatic change in their life because they didn't grow up in a Christian home and the change is so powerful that people are shocked by someone who goes from night to day. I mean, it's just darkness to light, and the transformation is incredible. We're going to talk about one in a minute here. Okay, so the final uh, life change, life-changing truth is the presence of the Holy Spirit, now in the life of believers. And that's what was happening on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came, and God's Spirit comes and lives inside of us. How beautiful is that? So, once the resurrection became a reality, then the Holy Spirit came. And he's in our world. It's the indwelling presence of Christ, God's Spirit living inside of us. <clears throat> it's Christ in us. Not only are we in Christ, but Christ is in us, and it's the Spirit of God living inside of us. And so Peter's explanation is this. God raised this Jesus to life, and we're all witnesses of this fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, which has been poured out, which now you see and hear. So the outpouring of the Spirit was to make it known to us that Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's, that's what happens. And, and all of us can say this. If you've given your life to Jesus, you know that the work of the Spirit is in your life. You can sense something's happening within you. God is at work. He's speaking into your soul. He's, he's addressing things in our lives. 
Uh, and the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, I think, is one of the most powerful proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he's at work today. He's, he's convicting and convincing us of our need for Christ. And I'll give you an example. I read this a few years ago of a young Cuban named McGill. Now McGill, you know, he kind of grew up in a large family, received very little attention from his parents. His life was filled with hurt and anger and hatred and fighting. And at 14, he ran away and he ended up, he traveled to Havana to go to school, but then eventually quit. He went to the coast and he became involved in the tr drug trade. And so he began planting and cultivating marijuana and cocaine. Okay, so, because, you know, he was caught up in trying to make money and living that kind of a lifestyle. And so he had several hectares of cocoa plants and he had about 40 people working with him on the cocaine and marijuana plantation. On one occasion, he was asked to go take a look at a plot some distance away and he forgot to take any reading material. So the lady that was kind of uh, letting them use the property, she had this big plantation, she gave him a New Testament. Now I'm gonna tell you something. God's word is extremely powerful, handled with care. So he takes the New Testament, he's got nothing else to do. He starts reading about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and he gets so caught up in the story that when he gets back, he actually begins a Bible reading group among his employees. So now, yep, just follow this for a minute. So he's not a Christian, and they're all there, the, co co uh, the cocaine workers and marijuana workers are sitting around studying the New Testament, reading the Bible. I'm telling you, that's a dangerous thing to do. It's gonna get you into trouble. <clears throat> so they're doing this, and one day, McGill has an accident. And so everybody ends up going on vacation and he's distraught and, you know, he turns into the, a radio program. It just happens to be a gospel broadcast and they're preaching about the gospel of Jesus and talking about how empty life is apart from Christ, the guilt, the shame, the brokenness, the meaninglessness. And McGill hears the sermon and at the end, he prays with the radio broadcaster and gives his life to Jesus. He gets so excited that when the workers come back, he begins to tell them the story of Jesus and what it really means and how they can become Christians. And he said, every last one of those 40 workers gave their life to Jesus. Now, how many think this is amazing? So he starts, to, he destroys all of the, the apparatus, you know, all the marijuana plants, the, uh, the laboratory, gets rid of everything related to drug trafficking. And now these guys... Uh, he says, he writes, from our little band of cocaine farmers, we now have 12 pastors. And I've planted 10 churches. How many go, this is amazing. This is what God does. You know, God can do amazing things in our lives if we let him do it. So the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is able to raise us up from our spiritual death, which is our separation from God. And he's able to change us to become the person God intends us to become. So what should our response be to the good news about Jesus' death and resurrection? I think the response should be the same as it was back then. As a matter of fact, let me just read the closing verses in conclusion here. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. In other words, they felt terrible. They were convicted. They realized they were wrong. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, what should we do? And he said, repent. In other words, change your thinking. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which they had asked about right then in that, what was going on. They said, you're gonna receive this gift. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them to save themselves from this corrupt generation. Folks, we've always lived in a corrupt generation. We need to save ourselves from it. How? Through Christ. Those who accepted the message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number. Now, you know, I have a great imagination. They're in the upper room. How many are there? 120. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. They go out. 
They preached the sermon, and the next day, the church went from 120 people to 3,120 people. How many go, that's, that's mind-boggling. Anybody think that's incredible? Is that crazy or what? You know, I can't even imagine it. It's so incredible. The lives, the people changing that quickly. But you know, God had been preparing this. That was really the birthday of the New Testament church. So, those who accepted it were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They repented, which means they came into an agreement with God's understanding of their condition, and they turned to him. They were baptized as an outward expression of an inward change, and they received God's indwelling presence and became part of the church, God's community of faith. And what was true for them is equally true for us today. Let's stand. <clears throat> You know, I get excited about Easter because, you know, it just brings us right back to the core of our whole Christian life. Jesus, if he had not risen from the dead, there would not be a church today. And I mean nowhere there would be a church. Humanity would be living in death and darkness. Our world would be in terrible shape. If you think it's bad, it, I don't even know it could survive without God's grace. How beautiful this is. But you know what, it's true. Jesus did rise from the dead, the church exploded all over the world, and the church is still growing today. Do you know there are more Christians living right now than have ever lived in all of human history? Is that shocking? It's true. There are more people alive on our planet today and there are more Christians than ever before. And it keeps expanding. You know, sometimes we look at our little world, we go, it just seems to be a struggle here, but there's parts of our world, the church is just exploding right now. It's amazing. But I don't want you to feel left out. I want you to feel included, and so does God. And so this morning, this morning as I close right now in prayer, I'm gonna pray a prayer. And if you say to yourself, listen, I want to experience a life change, just like you know, these men experienced in their lives, the Spirit of God coming upon them. Probably the greatest example is Paul himself, a man who was persecuting Christians now became its greatest advocate. Isn't that amazing? What changed? He met Jesus. And that's what I'm trying to say today. You can meet Jesus today by opening your heart and saying, I wanna know you. And I'm gonna pray a prayer and you can just pray along with me in your heart and you can just say, I wanna know you, Jesus. I want to experience your life. I want to get to know your ways. I want to walk with you. I want to have my sins forgiven. I want to know the shame and the guilt of my past totally eradicated from my life. I want a new beginning. I'm hitting a reset button. I'm calling out to you today. I'm, I'm embracing the one who designed me to find the true design and meaning for my life. I want to know you, Jesus. Would you come into my life right now? Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you give me this new beginning? And I thank you for hearing my prayer because your word does say that if I call on your name, Jesus, and I call out to you and I ask you to be Lord of my life, you're gonna hear this call and you're gonna respond to me and you're gonna come into my life and you're gonna bring about not only forgiveness, but healing from brokenness, shame, and and all the things that have gone on in my past. You're gonna give me a new beginning. You're gonna make me a new person. It's a new creation, your word says, and I want it. I want to experience it right now. And so Jesus, I invite you in. I invite you in to cleanse me. I invite you in to heal me. I invite you in to forgive me. I invite you in to direct my life. And I thank you for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you prayed that prayer, listen to me very carefully now. Christianity is personal, but it's not private. I, I read that the other day by Nikki Gumbel. I love that statement, it's so true. And if you're gonna walk with God, you have to do it in community. You can never do it alone. They were added to the church here. They didn't just do their own thing. It's not a private thing. It's personal, but it's not private. And you're gonna need help on this journey, I know. We all do. And so in front of you in the pew, there's a little contact card that says, you know, write your name down, put down today's date. 
I prayed with pastor today and I accepted Jesus. I want to start the new journey. And we're going to contact you and we're going to help you in your journey. Okay, does that sound fair? We're going to help you with your journey. We're going to help you understand what this really means and how you can really develop and grow as a Christian. We're going to help you succeed in this journey. So you have to communicate with us, otherwise we'll never know. So that's your part. That's your response that we're going to ask you to do. And there's a card there. If there isn't one there, go to the welcome desk or the guest reception desk or the welcome desk. There's a card somewhere for you there. Fill it out. Let us know. We'll get back to you. All right? Have a wonderful Easter weekend. God bless you. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm the middle school youth director here at Living Stones Church, and I want to thank you for joining us this morning. We encourage you to fill out the Connect card on our website. We would love to hear from you and get to know you. If you have any prayer requests or if there's anything that we can do for you, please let us know. If you decide to visit us in person, please say hello. I would love to meet you. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.